but we're going to go back and uh, walk through the step three prayer, kind of show you how it ties into step four and the rest of the steps, actually. So if you want to know where we're starting, that's where we're starting. We do not represent any 12-step fellowship. We are here to share how the literature and the directions contained within the big book have transformed our lives in every way. We are here to share our experience with our journey through the steps, what the steps mean to us, and how we have seen the steps change the lives of the many we have worked with. The main focus of this study is to show people how the design for living can work in anyone's life when the literature is understood, and more importantly, applied in a practical way. What this looks like in everyday transactions and how the small moments and choices are what add up to an amazing new quality of recovery, relationships, and life satisfaction. Oh, you rewrote it. No, it's been the same for like weeks. You're just listening because you turned up the volume. Creator, uh, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful day. And the gift of my life, the gift of life. So I want to thank you for the mini vacation that I had and allowing me to kind of see your beauty in another part of the, the province. And glad to be home, glad to be with my friends and my fellowship. And I ask you, Creator, to uh, to guide me and Janine today as we walk through this literature, this very important literature of Step Four life-changing pieces of material. I ask that you allow us to come up with our experiences and, and use them in a good way, in a way that we can heal, in a way that we can teach and learn and grow. Creator, I thank you for everybody here, and I ask that you, you get into the hearts of everybody on the screen and maybe in person and help guide them to uh, their most authentic self, their most authentic truth. Allow them to be the best versions of themselves that they can be. Creator, I just want to thank you for, for allowing me to be of use today and, and showing me what my purpose is, at least for today. Hi, hi. God, thank you for everyone that's come today and who joins us online. Let tonight be an opportunity that clarity can come to all of us uh, in the areas of where self is getting in the way of who you want us to be, whether that's fear, whether that's resentment, whether it's relationships that aren't good for us. Show Oof. us where the dishonesty is that we can't see. What did I do here? And give us the people who can help us see it when we can't. But let tonight mostly bring clarity for people as we go through this literature and help them to be honest with themselves in the area that's most troubling to them today and, and give them the courage to go out and make the changes that they need to with you. Because we can do everything when you're on our side. Nothing can be against us. Amen. Okay. So we just did step three. Um, is there anyone in here that, uh, has never really done step three before? Everyone's done step three. Has anyone done step three, like a few times and then drank before again? Anyone? Okay. So has anyone done step three and never drank again? Okay. So there's a whole bunch of people that didn't answer either question, <laughs> but whatever. So I often talk about, so, you know, in the doctor's opinion, the doctor had a theory that we had an allergy to alcohol. So the doctor had a theory and he washed alcoholics long enough for his whole life. And then he finally wrote up this theory that we have an allergy to alcohol. and it interested people, although there was no scientific proof. And actually, in some ways, there's still no real scientific proof of the fucking allergy to alcohol. But to us alcoholic, it makes good sense. It explains many things for which we could not otherwise account. And uh, when you look at kind of 
all the methods in the world to get sober and stay sober, pretty much this one out of the big book is the best one there is. It's the most successful. So there must be some to what doctor, the doctor's opinion had to say, Dr. Silkwood. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of putting myself in Dr. Silver. Recording in progress. And, and what the fuck's going on here? I gotta shut this off. So I, I came up with my own theory. Okay. My own theory is that the ego that I have or the ego that you guys have or whoever it is can attach to the ideal of God. And the ego can think that it's doing God's will. And then it gets drunk again. And I've seen it over and over and over. How many people have come up to the podium or shared in a meeting like, fuck me and God, me and God, we're so fucking tight. And then that's on a Wednesday and on Friday they're drunk. And I kept seeing this over and over and over. And I was like, why is it that somebody who fucking swears they've turned their will in their life over on Wednesday is drunk by Friday and they might even have done the steps or maybe they're halfway through the steps or wherever they're at. It doesn't really matter. And I came up with my own idea. The ego is really powerful, right? That's what we're trying to smash. And the ego is actually based on a hundred forms of fear and self delusion. And through my sponsorship, the number one thing that I've seen through doing step fives is the person who I've done a step five with, or any of us alcoholics, our true, our true uh, issue is validation. We need validation. We always want validation. We're always seeking validation. So we will be the chameleon in many different shapes and forms as the actor to try to achieve and get the validation that we need, that we think we need. And uh, so the ego always wants validation. So the ego never wants to be left out. So it'll always think that it has a connection with God because it doesn't want to be left out, right? But the book also talks about at a certain point, effective mental defenses. I can remember what it was like last week when I went to jail. I can remember I'm going to lose my kids. I can remember that I get in car accidents, that my car ends up in the ditch, that I end up fucking getting my ass kicked. I beat women, whatever the deal might be. I can always remember that. And then I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. And I'm praying. And then I make it some time and I'm sober and I'm praying in the morning. And I might pray when I get into a tight situation during the day. And then uh, sometimes I'm going to even pray at night. And I'm like, I'm pretty connected because I'm fucking sober today. And then all of a sudden I'm not sober and I'm drunk. And my, my belief is, that we end up using God as an effect of mental defense against the first drink. We don't really have God working in and through us in our lives. We have the idea of God and the ego likes the idea that we're attached to God. But the reality is, is we're not using God in and through us, which is what we actually need. So we need a program of practical action to actually allow God to work in and through us. And the inventory is a huge part of it. You guys did step three. Um, and on page 62, at the bottom, it talked about this is the how and the why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that here after in this drama of life, that God was going to be our director that he is the principal and we are to be his agent. He is the father and we are his children. Most good ideas are simple and this concept was the keystone. It says this concept, which is what? An idea. So this is a concept at this stage. It's an idea, but it's the concept where we pass through, through the arch to freedom. New and triumphant arch to freedom. But if it only stays a concept, we don't fucking pass through anywhere. So how do we take this concept of God and we, we put it into action? Because if I can actually put the concept into action, then I can have God working in and through me. And I can actually turn my will and my life over, not theoretically, but fucking real, right? 
way back in We Agnostic, you talked about, um, do I believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? And it says on that, on that concept, we can build this wonderfully effective spiritual structure. So it's kind of alluding to back in the We Agnostic that God's just an idea. And if I can take this idea and I can fucking make a reality, I can build this wonderfully effective spiritual structure. But if I just go into life and this is only just a thought and a concept and idea, but no real action. But the thing about the ego is it thinks it's taking the action, but it's never really taking the action. And what I've seen about the program is most people don't even know what the actions are in this book. So they're not really actually taking the action in their life. They think they know what it is. But when you think you know, you're actually living your life with the best of intention, but your motives are never revealed. And it's really important to reveal the motives because the motive is what your will is. And we always think that God is always just good things in our lives. But God is the seemingly good and the seemingly bad. Okay? So as we kind of get to the step three prayer, this is really important. So we're going we're gonna to start here on page 63. Do you want to add anything before we go? I did want to say early on there that when you were talking about you were observing people who they were saying like, yeah, I've got God and then going out and drinking. Yeah. That made me want to say that I experienced that in, in my church days where I would really feel a connection to God or think I had a connection to God, but then I would find myself sinning and feeling very guilty. Or I would see other people around me doing doing likewise. And I never could figure out in church how to connect to God. And there was never any sort of instruction on how to do that. And so one of the things early on with you talking to me about just this program that I really resonated with was when you were talking about to sin is to miss the mark. And how later I learned that in doing the process as we get into step 10 um, and in the day-to-day -day and every little moment we're bringing God in and that's actually how you do it and and that's the whole that's the whole thing of it is to be bringing God into all of the moments not just the crises and every decision and in every fear and in every little moment that you're that you're living um, there's lots and lots of opportunities that go unmissed or that go missed that we could be bringing God in and need to be bringing God in. And I could never catch those because I'd never knew what I was looking for. So as we move into the, the actor and setting that up to move into the four, that was what gave me the information on the, the starting place of where my self will was, because that was, that was shown to me um, through my five. And as I created the list in six, there was my will. And, and then I had, now I knew, you know, I could solve the problem or start to, because I could, could now see what the problem was, which was me all along and the way that my instincts were driving me into places and I, and I had no power against them. And then in, in figuring out how to actually bring God in, recovery was made and, and also the connection to God that I had always looked for, but was never able to find. Carry okay. on. Okay. And just to follow up on her point. Um, it is it is the pennies and the nickel. It is the little things that actually matter the most. Most people are going to live their life with the best of intention, right? Um, and underneath the intention is the motive. The motive is what we need to see. Most people will use this book as a moral and philosophically comforting idea. Or the program in general is moral and philosophically comforting. And then we maybe do the steps, maybe we don't do them. And then we go out into life and we're like, oh, yeah, I'm fucking angry right now. I'm supposed to be kind. And then what do we do? We change our anger and we go, okay, I need to be kind. So then I start being kind. But I'm not really genuinely being kind. I'm doing it because I'm supposed to be. Okay, Which is, I guess, okay. It's better than the alternative. But in that moment where I'm supposed to be kind, I should be like, God, I ask you to. And we go to God. We ask for his help. Instead of self-willing the principle of kindness into my affair, there's a process to that because my will is I'm not being kind and I'm judging you or I'm being arrogant or whatever it might be. In that moment, I go to the step 10 process. 
And I'm like, God, I ask you to remove this from me at once, please. And then it says we talk to somebody immediately. We make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. We resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Then I leave the results up to God. And the principles are the result out of that. That's how that works. So when you follow the practical instructions of the program, you always identify your will and you leave the results up to God. The thing about that, when you're living your life with the best of intention, you're never leaving really the results up to God because you're still trying to always get something. You're trying to manipulate somebody to give you something or you're trying to get that job. Or you're, you're trying to direct something in a way. When you follow the real processes, you're not directing anything anymore and you're actually kind of butt hurt and you get, you get, you know, fucked up because you're not getting anything that you really want, which is really important because you learn through that. You're actually building character through that. You're not resisting it. And you know, you're seeking humility as something to be desired, although you don't really know what it is. You're actually seeking humility as something to be desired. And it doesn't have to take a long, calm, long time and take the long route there. Practicing the principles in your affairs without the processes, it takes a long, calm, a long time. So, and the reason I'm telling you guys this stuff now is because the dots are going to connect as we move forward from here. Okay. So some of this, you might be like, fuck, what does that mean? But that's okay, because as we move forward from here, the fucking light bulb should go off and you'll be like, whoa, Paul, the question was, give us an example of how we can bring God into the small moments. Okay, so something that would maybe apply to everybody in Calgary is the driving traffic. And so when, when you're driving and or when I'm driving and I'm in a rush or I get cut off or so I'm in a rush and people aren't driving as fast as I want them to be and I notice this coming up, I bring God in before it turns into the middle finger. So it's like the minute you start to notice that you're starting to get a little bit of a way, that's an opportunity to bring God in so that it doesn't have to get to a big middle finger. Um. So how would that play out in my head? So if I'm, it, it plays out like, um, God, slow me down. I'm going to get there when I get there. Protect me on this drive and be with the person who just cut me off because clearly they've got somewhere to go that I don't understand and they're in a rush. They're in a bad way themselves. Help me to just have patience and let it go. And that ending was we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. So she, maybe it wasn't even that resolutely, and like resolutely means in a determined, unwavering, deep manner, we pray for somebody else. At some of the stages of the growth, we're not really resolutely doing anything. We're just doing it as part of the action because we're supposed to. But as you do this more and more and more and more, you will see a difference and you will become resolutely really wanting for that person who cut you off to like have God with them or, you know, maybe, you know, fuck, maybe that you really do believe they're in need of something because they're on their way somewhere. And then it makes a difference in the subconscious, right? As we went through the actor part, um, that's a, that's a talking piece that I use a lot when I'm going through that with afterwards, like you can use it with your sponsees to talk about, you know, when they're angry at people to look at other people as the actor. You know, like, so people can let you into traffic and it's all good and it's all good. But what happens when that asshole's cutting you off? You know, like he's trying to get somewhere. He's trying to get somewhere. Well, when I'm doing that, I'm, I'm in a panic. I'm late. I've, I've had a crappy day, whatever it might be. I can see myself in that situation as that person. And then I'm, I'm able to say like, that person's just another actor doing their best and they're stepping on toes right now. But they, you know, there's a bigger story than them just being an asshole in traffic. And so I, I kind of use that as like, look at other people as they're doing the best they can, you know, with, and it can look like all kinds of ways. They can be nice. They can be like this. They can be like that, but then they can be mean and egotistical when the show doesn't go off like that. But really what they're trying to do is come at it the way that they think, because they're running their own show without God and we're stepping on toes. So I'll flip it in my mind every time really now that I look at people as the actor themselves. And that's very helpful. <laughs> okay we're gonna read step three prayer middle of 63 
God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. So it's an offering, right? It's like I'm, I'm making the offer here. It's different than the step seven prayer. A lot of people think those two prayers are pretty much the same prayer, but when you actually dissect the words, they're totally different prayers. This is an offering prayer. That's really it. Step seven is I'm fucking willing. There's been a change from step three to step seven where you're fucking becoming, may I, an offering to I am willing by your step seven. To build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. What does that mean? It means that God is going to take you down and he is going to strip you of your own self-sufficiency and your ego. And then he's going to build you again. But you got to be a participant in this, this rebuild. You got to be the one that relinquishes the parts of you that aren't serving you. You got to be the one that let's push your pride aside and, you know, let these things go. And if you don't let them go, you're not going to have that part of you rebuild, right? So it's kind of like, I often use this analogy, and I should probably think of a new one, but it's like if they wanted to renovate this building, they're going to come in here and they're going to rip up the floors, rip down the walls, tear down the light fixtures, rip the doors down, and that's what's happening on the inside. Remember in the Roland Hazard story where Carl Jung said, you know, Roland, you need the vital spiritual experience. And Roland's like, okay, I believe in God. And, and Carl's like, that's not good enough. You can have earnest religious beliefs, but they're not good enough. Because it doesn't spell the necessary vital spiritual experience. So what was he talking about? He's like, you need to take the ideas, emotions, and attitudes that you run your life with, Roland. You need to cast them aside and allow something new to dominate you. So that's kind of what the renovation is. We're taking your old ideas, emotions, and attitudes. We're looking at what they all are. We're going to rip them down. We're going to tear them down and fucking give you new ones, new conceptions to dominate you. That's what the rebuild is. Only the rebuild takes time and it takes fucking pain. So the walls of this building are hurting when the sledgehammer is going through the wall. When the pry bar is ripping down sheets of plywood and you're getting your sheets of pride and ego ripped apart on the inside of you that's really painful some of that plywood's been protecting you for fucking 30 years trying to keep you safe the only thing is it doesn't keep you safe it makes you sicker so we got to tear down these walls inside and allow god to rebuild us um relieve me of the bondage of self okay that i may better do thy will Take away my difficulties. Anyone on what are my difficulties? Shane said my defects of character. And that's what it is. When we first come in here, we think my difficulties are all my problems. Oh God, please take away the 30 grand I owe Revenue Canada and my crazy ex-wife bullshit and my shitty job. So, and I'll be, and I'll be helpful. If you take all those things away and make them better, I'll be helpful, God. I promise. I promise. That's not what we're talking about. That's the idea of like, I'll have no problem. So then I can help because right. then I'll be, yeah. And that's right. a bad approach. <clears throat> 10 4. Mm -hmm. So, really, what it is, it's your defects character that you're going to learn about in step four. And then it says, as victory over them. Victory over what? The defects. Why you got to be victorious? Because letting them go is fucking hard. When you have 30 years of fucking playing the same protective mechanism over in your brain or your, your self-seeking mechanism to get that relief of whatever it is you need relief from, to let that go and try something new, it's not going to be easy. You know, For you to find that money isn't going to make you happy, and let go of like the money part where maybe that's the biggest growth in your life. Or maybe it's letting go of relationships when you've always clung to relationships to, to validate yourself your whole life. Or maybe it's fucking porn that gives you that fucking power and control or gambling or anger. I don't know what it is for you. But to let that go is fucking not going to be an easy process. And that's just the stuff that you can see clearly. Because then there's all the things that you can't see because 
the greatest enemy hides in the part that you're never going to look, which is you described as or disguised as self. And I think like what you were talking about, where be, be prepared for this painful rebuild. We see that all the time. Like when, when people joke about careful what you pray for, because you pray for it. And, and even when you're not like looking for the pain that comes with it, it's noticeable. Like, it's like, oh, I just prayed for this. And here's the, here it is now in front of me. And, and it's like that to a bigger scale, to the degree that you want to change. Like you keep praying for that and you, you be prepared that you're going to keep getting that. And that's not just a funny thing. Like too many people say that way too often. Like I prayed for this and then now here we are. And, but if you choose to do different, you, you become different through that and you shed the old way and you become something new through God. Yeah. And like, you, we don't know how God works, right? Our mind is so small and we are so limited in what we think is going to be the result that we don't often know. So when God comes along and kind of gives you what you prayed for, um, can you hear me? Huh. So when you come along and God gives you kind of what you prayed for, like might be, uh, you need a new job to make more money to take care of your family better. And God comes along and they lay you off. And you're like, what the fuck? I didn't ask for a layoff. I, I needed a job. I needed more money. I needed a raise or a new job, God. And now you give me a layoff and I can't support my family. But God's behind the scenes kind of arranging something better. And then you fuck it up because you need what you need. And you're not patient enough to kind of settle in. When maybe it might have been a good month of pain where you're learning acceptance. You're learning to trust because through the pain, we always rely on God more usually. And maybe that's what God's trying to do. He's like, okay, my son, I'm going to take this away. I really need you to let go of that and rely on me. And once you're reliant on me, then I'm going to give you this. Because you made that decision two months ago in your step three, and this is what you're asking for. But people are so afraid that they won't let things play out, right? And we'll get more into that as we keep going through this. And when that happens, like the thing that I find that comforts me is like in step 11, it says, we let God discipline us. And it's like, my sponsor always reminds me, it's not me that's deciding, like praying for which to what to what. And when things go in the way that I, I, I don't understand, it's like, we, I let God just figure it out. Like God's going to put it there and discipline me the way that I need to grow. Okay. <clears throat> so, and when it says, take away my difficulties so that victory over them. The word victory is really important in that sense because it says it's going to be a fight. There's going to be a fight there. And the fight is in your step 10. So I'm going to let the cat out of the bag a little bit here so that we can connect the dots later. Step three is actually done in step 10. Okay. So where it says, take away my difficulty so that victory over them means there's a fight here, okay? So when you get to step 10 and you look at the exact directions in this book, the principle behind step 10 is perseverance. And perseverance means to fight through. And when you take what we learn here in step four and five and we move it into the 10, it's the same shit. But the willingness that I need to fucking change comes out of my step six, right? And my step six is in the 10 also. So the, anyone that's ever seen me at a meeting, they know how adamant I am about following the directions in the step 10. Not what it says on the wall, not what the treatment centers say it is, but what it actually is in the book. Because if you learn what it is in the book, you learn how to turn your will and your life over the care of God. And your fucking life will change. But if you just go on the theory on the what's on the wall or doing a nightly inventory, it takes you a long fucking time. And a lot of people actually fucking die and don't recover because of that one thing. Okay. So. And then why are we doing all this work? Anyone? Okay, so we can be fucking of service. So we all come here because we want to be better and we want our lives to be better and we want to get on with the business out there of 
having what it is that we want. Okay. And then we usually find once we go out there and we focus on the world of the material and getting what I want again, I end up back here fucking drunk again because I don't fucking get that part yet. And so many people don't get that part. So many people won't sponsor. They won't take a service position. They won't do any of that stuff because selfish self-centeredness is at the root of their trouble. And when you do this work at some point, maybe after you're beaten by relapse after relapse for years and years and years, you keep trying to get the money and the women and the car and the fucking jewelry. And eventually you come back here because that shit doesn't fix it. And then you finally give this actually a shot and you start trying something different and you're of service. Then you're like, holy fuck, I wish I did this 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so do the other 3000 people that died in between. Because that's what happens. So we're not doing this work for us. The, the benefit of this is when I work for you, it works for me. When I give to you, you give to me. The book has a line and it's really important that says common sense thus becomes uncommon sense. So when I live and work for you, I actually get what I always wanted. But I always tried to work for me to get what I always wanted for me. And I'd maybe throw you a bone out of the best of intention, but my motive was just to like, fuck you off or whatever, right? So it's really important to know that this work is done to be of service to God and your fellows. How easy that comes is, is a different question. I agree with everything that Bill says about like the three and the six and the 10 and everything, but for the purposes of sponsoring and taking somebody through the step, it doesn't have to be explained like that. I don't explain it like that because it's not, it's something that takes a while, I think, for people to actually see how all the steps kind of mishmash into each other and work together. And so I don't even recommend explaining it like that when you're when you're sponsoring people and unless they're at that place that that's a way to say it. But for the for most people, when you're taking them through the steps, you don't want to overcomplicate it and get them through the steps, and then later this stuff can be added. And as they get a handle on the sobriety and stuff, I've, I've had this come up actually a few times this week, just that um, th this fear being expressed to me about sponsoring and not being able to, and like, if you're here at this book study, this is a little bit more complex than what is required. I think like, like back in the day, they just read this book. And so this has been broken apart. And I think that um, like what attracted me to Bill was that, uh, and it wasn't your hair, but um, what it was, was that he he had the depth and it matched over top of a lot of things that I already had kind of running in the background and his ability to explain this in a way that, that just was the, the deeper spirituality part I was really drawn to. Um, but that's not like you're where people start out. And so I, I have been telling people like you just, all you have to do when you're sponsoring and starting out sponsoring the answers are just in here that the, all that it is is here and you just let god work between you and you sit down with somebody and you go through and you literally just have to read the book and the things that come up are just like what god wants to come up and you don't have to even worry about it and if you have any sort of questions you got pillars and you got sponsors and you can ask them but really it's it's super simple you just sit down and you read the book and god does the rest so if you have any sponsorship anxiety or think you have to do it, anything like this, that's not true. You just, you just use the book. Everything is in there in the black and white. 100%. And this big book study is a little complex and I do go into some shit, but I usually will clarify when I get into the sponsorship areas so that you guys understand that it's simple, yeah. <clears throat> but I'm glad she brought that up because it's true. Um, and this is more for you guys, right? And I know a lot of the people in here are like, they're looking for that next level. And a lot of people don't know that step three is actually complete in your step 10. So I want people to understand how important step 10 is to actually understand because it'll make the difference in your life from fucking suffering to fucking not suffering. And understanding the, the complexity or the theory behind step six is super fucking important too, because that's also the component of your step 10 and a component of the three. 
So I really kind of, what I do is I work along the big book studies and I talk about certain things over and over and over. And you guys have seen, it's just the same shit over and over. But by the time we get later down, you'll, the dots will have connected and you'll really go, fuck, step 10 is super important. And then when you go to the meeting, if you're a treatment center guy who learned the steps in treatment, you'll go, holy fuck, that's not what they taught me. And that's what they taught me in treatment, but you're teaching me something different and it makes a difference. And then you take that to the room and you take that to your sponsees and you guys are changing the landscape of the program because you actually are doing what the program is. Because step, step 10 is not doing a nightly inventory at night. That's step fucking 11. But every treatment center person on the fucking planet comes to the rooms and they share what their step 10 is and they share that they do a nightly fucking inventory and then they go on for years thinking step 10 is doing a nightly inventory. And they miss the mark through the day. There could have been a hundred mm -hmm. step tens in the day on these little mm -hmm. micro moments that yeah. she talked about that makes the fucking difference in your life. Then you're not struggling. And when you don't make the many differences in your life during your life, like during the day, you fucking drink over that shit. Cause you can't possibly keep a fucking good nightly inventory and keep everything at bay. Doesn't work like that. So that's kind of why I'm saying this shit. So you guys as sponsors and working it in your own life can fucking take this to the next level. Of course, you can't teach somebody brand new what I'm telling you. They'll just go drink because it's too confusing. Anyway. <laughs> so let's just kind of blast you the last of this and get into the four before it's 730 and then we'll take a break. So we found a very desirable... Uh, to take the spiritual step with an understanding person, person such as their wife, best friend, spiritual advisor. But it's better to meet God alone than with one who might misunderstand. The wording was, of course, quite optional so long as we expressed the idea. Voicing it without reservation, this was only a beginning. Though if honestly and humbly made, an effect sometimes a very great one was felt at once. That line's important because a lot of people will do the step three process. And a really big effect takes place. And it says here, a very great one could be felt at once. And then that person thinks that they're never drinking again. And they're like, fuck, I feel God. And like, they, they can feel some God because you've worked the first three steps. You get on your fucking knees and you say this sincerely, you're going to feel some change. But that's not the spiritual awakening. That is a piece of it. That will never keep you fucking sober. You got to keep moving. Same with the spiritual experience after the step five. It's another profound one that might happen right on the spot, or maybe it takes a week or two. That one feels good too, but they don't keep you fucking sober. So that's important. Okay. And you'll see that all this shit I'm saying, if you stick around the program, you'll see that, that what I'm saying is true. Next, we launched on a course of vigorous action. Launched. We moved. We fucking got going. As fast as you're on your knees saying this prayer, you're as fast writing this shit out on your fucking notebook. As quick as possible. Boom, boom. The first step of, of which is a personal house cleaning, of which many of us have never attempted. Though our decision, what decision? The one that we need to save our lives, the step three decision. The thing about this decision, and going back to 63 for a second, top of the page, when we sincerely took a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. When I sincerely take this position that I'm going to turn it over and learn what that means to God, that's when this fucking happens. Not when my ego thinks it happens, when my fucking body fucking believes that it's happening. Right? I fucking concede to my innermost self that I'm fucking doing this and I'm turning it over. When I sincerely turn it over, he provides what I need if I do the things that I'm supposed to do. So there's a big difference between admitting I'm an alcoholic and conceding to my innermost self. Big difference between my ego saying I'm turning it over and my fucking being really wanting to turn it over. 
Um, though our decision was a vital and crucial step. Vital means very fucking important. You got to move through this shit. It also means giving of life, vital, vitality. The more you learn how to turn it over, the more free you get. And the more free you get from the bondage of your own bullshit self, the, the more happier you live. The less stress, the less you don't make decisions because God makes them. And God's actually making them because in step 10, there's a promise. It says, you know, we become God conscious. We intuitively know how to handle these situations. We, we get guided by a spirit, by a divine intervention in our lives. And we don't fucking need to run the show and wear ourselves out. And there's freedom in all of this. But you don't know until you fucking do it. And you're like, holy fuck, this God dope is a real thing. You know, people hear that word God dope and they fucking think that we're just kind of probably making it up. But it's not made up. It's fucking real. <laughs> it could have little permanent effect if, unless at once followed by strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom. Therefore, we started a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing process. It is an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. One object is to disclose damaged or unsaleable goods to get rid of them promptly and without regret. If an owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about the values. So I talk about this with, with sponsees in the sense that I get, I get more than not that people are dreading or they have the anxiety or that this is going to be this big dreadful undertaking and so just to speak to it that this is like kind of exciting because you're going to be looking for the truth about yourself and and in that truth you're going to be set free like this is actually what it, what it says like this is the key to getting out of your mess is to do this stuff and and this is actually what this right here is like the whole point like you got to find a you got to find the things in you that you got to get rid of and so you should be excited about it and so just to kind of speak to the fact that change your mind about it a bit and we're going into this to to do a house cleaning so that you're set free and this is exciting okay i just want to touch on a couple of things uh step four business which takes no regular inventory you're the business have you ever took regular inventory the most inventory anyone us of us ever takes is your inventory <laughs> i take your inventory constantly my whole life what a fucking asshole See what that guy just did? You see how he treated me? Look how you treat me. That's how we take inventory. We take other people's inventory. That's really as far as it gets. Every now and then, maybe I'm partly to blame, just like it says back in step three. It says once in a while, we might take a little bit of the blame, but it's far more your fault than it ever is mine. And then it goes on to say, what, what happens then? Well, we stay sore. Why do we stay sore? Because we don't know that it's us and that we're causing the problem. So we're mad at them. And then we go off to the next scenario and the same shit's happening because we're behaving the same way. So the people are just treating us in the same way that we're setting it up for. And we continue to be sore. So if we want to get out of those patterns, we have to see the truth about them. Right. So um, usually goes broke. And when we come into the program, we're fucking broken. We're emotionally, mentally, physically, and many times financially broke. I was financially broke. A lot of people don't make it here because they don't get broken financially. They might be broken in all the other ways, but they're, if they still are able to make money, they won't come here. Now, there's a lot of people out there that we probably know that should be here, but because they make money and the pride, the money and the pride keep them out of here. And the delusion that I'm doing good because I have this as measured by the material world and to cling on to that because that's what the ego loves. So you delude yourself longer because you're not broken yet. Totally. So that's, that's important. Um, taking a commercial inventory. So if I'm the business, I need to take a commercial inventory. It's a, it's a fact finding fact facing process. The problem is, is I don't always want to face the facts. Some people in my life have presented me with words and facts about me my whole life and i fucking never want to hear it 
So facing the facts part is not always easy, right? Because you got to look at yourself and go, fuck, I'm kind of a piece of shit. Or, yeah, that's me. I'm very ignorant or arrogant or I'm promiscuous or I fucking manipulate people or whatever. So we have to look at those parts of ourselves. So it's not always going to be easy, right? But that's part of the demolition. That's part of the rebuilding. You got to fucking strip it down, right? Before you build it up. It is an effort to discover the truth about stock and trade. Not your truth, the truth. Which is why you can't do the self solitary self-appraisal by yourself because your pride and your subconscious has built so many walls for you to see the truth. So we have to look at that truth. And a sponsor really helps you look at that truth. And through the first number of steps, you've built that relationship with him or her. And they've been able to, you know, cut your pride and ego a little bit along the way. And by the time we get to this part, that's what this part is about. So you get to look at the truth about stock in trade, about yourself on the inside. One object is to disclose damaged and unsaleable goods. So this is one object only to disclose bring up to the surface damaged or unsaleable goods and get rid of them promptly without regret. What things in myself and my behaviors and my ideas, emotions, and attitudes are not serving me and they're not serving you. Sometimes I still think they serve me. That's why I need a sponsor in these processes and I need to look at the facts to go, actually, that's not serving me. That fucking, that little anger thing that I do to fucking manipulate people, that's actually not serving me. How many people have fucking abandoned me because of that? How many people have I pissed off at work? How many jobs have I lost because of this personality trait that I thought was good for me, but it actually isn't serving me? And nobody else really likes it either, or they'd be my friends, right? Whatever it might be, right? Um, so we got to find these things, whatever it is in you, and expose it, and discard of it promptly without regret. If the business is to be successful, if you are to be successful in your recovery in this process, you cannot fool yourselves about the values. And I'll, I'll kind of play with this one a bit. We have real values as a human being that are innate within us based on loving principles. And then we have values that society has taught us. A lot of the values we live with that cause our failure are ones that we learned out there from society. And those values are based in fear and they will fuck you over time. So money has a lot of values based in fear and our relationships and how they're built in our society are a lot of it's based in fear. And the values behind, let's say, relationships are that you need to give me love. You need to give me love. Give me love. I need love. Well, don't we learn around here that it's like it's by giving that I receive? It's by being vulnerable that I can actually get you to be vulnerable. But I've always been taught to fucking not try, not be vulnerable, not do these things and expect things from everywhere and anyone else. So I have to learn to fucking flip this shit. And I think too, like the, the they're driven in fear, but a lot of people wouldn't be able to identify yeah. that right off the mark. So a lot of that looks like the shoulds, like you should get married, you should get a career, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. It's like, the societal norms and expectations that I wouldn't say people would just be like, yep, that's a fear. But if you get to the root and when you're able to get to the root, there would be fear there of not complying. But certainly the values that drive us, a lot of them look like what we should and shouldn't be doing. And we follow those. And that a lot of times, like for me, it was like I was, there was a few of those, those values that I was following that that I was, I was missing who I was in that. And if, if I was to change what I was doing, it would be going against some of that. And so that's the fear. And what I learned a lot of my recovery at the beginning was actually pushing past that and uh, setting up a life for myself that was more aligned with what I actually value and believed in. And so the un untangling of that and so it, it's just uh, the constructs and church was a lot of it. Church comes and that's, a, that's fear. People can identify that. But anyways, go ahead. Yeah. And it, and it takes time, right? Mm -hmm. You're living your life with the best of intention. 
The intention is what we learned out here, how we learned how to live and what's important based on the values that we've learned. How do we learn the values that we're living in from parents, from schools, mm -hmm. from TV, from social media, from our peers, other males? Like a lot of the shit that I learned from other males was not healthy and actually a relationship. And, and because I wanted to be part of that male peer group, I had to, I wanted the validation of my peers. So I had to kind of do things I didn't want to do. I'd have to talk about women a certain way. I'd have to treat them a certain way. I'd have to look like the big shot and fucking put another notch on my belt and you know, whatever it was. So I knew in here I was going against something, but I didn't know any different. So I would just act how I needed to act to get the validation from my peers, the group of guys who are just fucking womanizing and being pieces of shit, really. And then I'd be with my girlfriend and I'd be totally sweet and different and try to, but I'm self-seeking there too. And then, you know, and then I'm at home with my mom or my dad and then I'm doing stupid, like fucking never ends. And then I'm in a total state of confusion and chaos in my head all, all the time. We yeah. talk about it. So he says not much for me. It's just like, it depends on the person. That's kind of like, I'll get back. I was just saying, talking about this with him is like I'll, every person that I've worked with, it's been a different experience. And that's just like sponsoring women. And it's been, they've it's been different walks of life, different exposure to the program, different, like it's been a big variety versus like, I think that the kind of person that has come to Bill has the similarities of like trying everything and, and needing more and then coming to Bill after, right? Would you say? So there's just been like, for me, I've been sponsoring women and it's only been a, like a, a year, say, of that. Um, so I only have that much information, but I would say that for me, I talk about it as, as relevant as it's coming up. Um, so some is none and some people have questions like yourself that we will hash out and come back to here and how it comes up right like as long as I'm bringing it back to the book and I can use this information to back up what I'm saying because the biggest thing is like not to get too caught up with the outside issues until they've gone through a set of steps so sometimes I'll say like that's relevant and it'll make sense after but can we just especially tabling diagnoses like I know when I was doing step fives out of the treatment center there was a couple times where girls would come in and it would be like I have this and this and this and all these labels and diagnoses and so hashing that out with like well if you're going to do the steps it's hard to really do the steps while we're um blaming the diagnosis for interrupting or you know like you, we have to look at it from a defects perspective because if you're going to blame over here it's really hard to untangle so give it a good shot at the steps and after you're done you can see which outside issues you want to pull back but stay focused on the steps and say the outside issues will table them yep you can grab them when you're done but don't mess around with that while you're going through the first step because it can be super confusing and uh, you don't get a clear thing because like if you straighten out mentally and physically, like a lot of this gets resolved. So. So I'm going to add. Um, it is on an individual basis, but if I'm taking somebody brand new that has barely been exposed to the program, it's fucking basic, basic. Fucking the fourth column barely gets talked about. I'm going to show you your fourth column issues. That's really about it. I'm barely going to talk about step six and seven. I might give you 10 at a fucking beginner level and you finish your steps. And now you got to live this to the best of your ability and stay sober. And then we can come back. But if I'm getting a chronic relapser or somebody that's been around for 15 years, getting the bunk message in the room, I, I might fucking talk like what we're, what we're talking about tonight to him, right? Depending on who it is and where they're at in their life. And like, there's some people I've worked with and I can see a whole bunch of their defects all through step one, two, three, four, five. And I don't say anything because I got to wait till the right time because they're too fucking fucked up to even fucking know what I'm going to say and they'll take offense to it or argue or argue or fucking whatever. So you got to wait. And then when that time is right, you fucking, you hit them. 
Well, they're they're too caught up in self. They don't know. So yeah, I'll back off. Mm -hmm. I'll just leave it alone. I won't go there. Or I'll say, you'll fucking see later mm -hmm. or something. And then later they see. I might, I might say like, can you just hold on to that? Because I don't want you talking about what you think is the problem or what your old beliefs are. Or this That'll sort itself out. So just like, let's just keep reading and just stop them from running the same narrative and the same script that we will actually want changed. Bottom of 64. Thanks, Paul. Middle of 64. Okay. So we did exactly is where we're going to start. Middle of the page. So we did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup, which caused our failure. Being convinced that self manifested itself in various ways is what defeated us. We considered its common manifestations. There's a lot in that paragraph. It's talking about um, being convinced. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup. These character flaws that are kind of in our makeup in our day-to-day -day living and life that cause our failure. And there's something I want to read. Can you pass me that 12 and 12? So this is in the 12 and 12. It's in step four. And this kind of highlights exactly what we're talking about. Page 50. First full paragraph just down from the top of the page. By now, the newcomers probably arrived at the following conclusions. That is character defects, representing instincts gone astray, has been the primary cause of his destructive drinking and failure at life. Unless he is now willing to work hard at the elimination of the worst of these defects, both sobriety and peace of mind will still elude him that all the faulty foundation of his life will have to be torn out and built upon a new bedrock. Okay, so what is that saying? It's saying that the character defects, the actions and behaviors and the ideas and emotions and attitudes that I'm acting out in in my life that are actually causing my failure, okay, are the primary cause of my destructive drinking and failure at life. And he puts drinking in there First, because that's what we need to kind of work on first when we get here. But really, the it's it causes our failure in life, Matt. Acting out in these defects causes the failure in my life, which actually causes me to drink. So I need to get a handle on this shit. And then it says, unless he is now willing to work hard at the elimination of the worst of these defects, first you got to see what they are. And then you got to be willing to work on the elimination of them. Both sobriety and peace of mind will still elude him. So a lot of people that don't work on the defects or they just try to self-will their, their program, and they end up drinking again because they're not making a, a good attempt at trying to give these up to God. And then they don't stay sober. Why don't they stay sober? Because that's why they drink. When you act out in selfish, self-centered behavior like self-seeking or self-pity or self-centered resentment, you fucking will drink. And if you don't fucking let that shit go, you'll drink. And then if you don't drink, then it says um, both sobriety and peace of mind will still elude you. The peace of mind eludes you. If you're able to put the drink down at all, which is rare, but if you can, then the peace of mind still eludes you. So there's a lot of people that come into the program, they get some time, but they're never at peace in their own fucking mind because they won't follow the processes defined in the steps. There's exact processes to follow. We'll just run the program with the best of our intention based on the moral and philosophically comforting um, book or program. We could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. We could will these things with all of our might. But the needed power is not there. We need the power, man. We can't will. As marshaled by our own will, we'll fail. And we fail utterly. I think because the of an example, just, you know, when people don't want to, change it's because they don't want to let go of something that they have a lot of the times and that's a relationship most of the time and 
there's a fear around that because they think that they need that relationship and that's what is giving the security. And so you can do this program in all other areas, but if there are areas of your life that you're not willing to let go of, it's that fear and you got to bring God in like, and, and move through that fear with God. And that's, that's, that's where you get the power from. Cause like as marshaled by the will, we don't have, we don't have it. Our human resources fail. And so we need to bring God in and, and we really got to bring God in into the areas that, that we know we need to, but we're not willing to let go of. And, and almost always, I see this coming up in, in relationships in some form that they don't want to let go of. Um, I also wanted to add something about the instincts that I think is interesting mm -hmm. is that um, Carl Jung is referenced in this book, but the other guy that was, that was big during this time was Sigmund Freud. And he is considered like the father of psychology. And he was a big deal at this time as well. And he was his, all of his work that is still very valid today is about the, the instincts that drive us unconsciously. And I believe it's my opinion that, that it's not a coincidence that during this time and that's what's written but I say this because we still we still do this in psychology we talk about the in, not the instincts like that but the things that unconsciously drive us but in this program we're talking about it more specifically to the things that are actually destroying us and and it's clear this is another example of how this is clear like this is much clearer than psychology just the way that you get out of it and but it's it's unconscious drives that we're using each other and to find the truth and then we bring God in and God shows us the truth but all of this shit until I came into this program for me it was it was all unconscious and out of my awareness and I had no idea why I was I had tried everything and so like when I had read this line here like this this whole page it's like kind of what changed everything for me the flaws I have it underlined here the flaws that caused my failure because I read it that day and I was like fuck this is why I'm failing and I just saw it that day it was so obvious that it was me somehow and if I continued on this program I was going to figure it out and I just had to stay tuned and do what it said and then I was going to figure out why I had ruined my life because I had no idea and so it, it was all unconscious and I was being driven you know blindly and powerfully and I had no idea why and how to get out of it so this was the the page that I was like this is going to show me the truth of why things are the way that it is. And it's going to tell me eventually how to get out of it. If I just be truthful here. Good stuff. And to add to that, I'm going back to that little reading on page 50. Um, unless we are now willing to work hard at the elimination of the worst of these defects that are actually driven at a deeper level, like Janine just talked about by the instincts. So the defects are here. The instincts are way deeper. When we look at the fourth column and the resentments, you're going to see the defects in your fourth column. And in the program, everyone talks about the fourth column, right? How many people talk about the third column? Not very many. Because the third column actually becomes far more fucking important over time than the fourth column does. But the program in the rooms is so mm, surface that nobody ever talks about the third column. Third column becomes more important. Why? Because you're rooting yourself down to where your the flaws in your makeup really come from. Remember back in step three, it said our problems we think arise out of ourselves. That's where the problems arise. They arise from deep down, way down within. They arise out of ourself and they come out in these defects. So we need to find out what the defect is and then follow it backwards into the root and then get into the root and when you think of a root of a tree you get to the root surface and then you don't know where the roots go and they're fucking unseen but that un those unseen roots actually produce that tree and all the branches of it so the unseen roots are actually producing all the defects and all the symptoms of your your manifestations of self and when you look at a root system of a tree all the roots grow into each other and they cross each other. And if they grow over each other, they'll actually eventually grow into each other and become part of one. So that's the instincts also. So it's not just so cut and dry to fucking relieve yourself of the shit. It takes fucking years and it takes years of doing this. And then it becomes a working part of your mind. 
and you just start healing. Both sobriety, peace of mind will still elude them. That all the faulty foundation of his life will have to be torn out, built upon a new bedrock. The faulty foundation of my life and your life is built on self. Self-centered fear, self-centered resentments, self-centered self, self, self. That's the faulty foundation of your life based in self. Where do you learn it? Out there. Okay? And then now it has to be torn out, build with me, do with me as thou wilt, tear it out, and build it on a new bedrock. Well, remember back in We Agnostics, upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure could be built. On the cornerstone of God is the new bedrock that you start building your life on. So we got to tear down self and build on, on love and build on God. That's how we get rid of this shit. And it doesn't happen over fucking night. And it only happens by continuous, persistent, consistent commitment to change. Because this is about change. And it's about letting shit go. And it happens through the processes and over time. Go ahead. So the, the column four is like in Bill's version of the tree. It's like how you're seeing it affects my, so you're fearful. So this comes out. And so you see the actual behaviors and, and that's the column four. So, so like a, an example I had um, come to mind was I had this one sponsee that it, it, it was like, what do I do? So it's like, well, I walk by the dishes and I don't get them cleaned up and then I get resentful, right? So it's like, then we ch chase that all back and it comes down to fear of the emotional security because if she was to ask her kids to remove the dishes, the kids would get annoyed with her. They, she feared they wouldn't want to hang out with her. She feared that they would spend less time with her and then, then she would be alone, right? So that that fear is actually in the column column three there but her behavior and how it's coming out like what was her part in in her resentment while well, she wasn't asking for what she needed and that was in column four so column four is like the obvious ways that you can see your part playing up in life but when you get deeper it's like the fear and that's the column three it affects my and the fear comes from like you see it bracketed it comes from like emotional security you're going to lose the people around you because they're going to be mad if you spoke up say so so in column four it would be i didn't speak up and then in column three it's like because it affects the the fear of the losing the emotional security so you see things going through these the steps first it's like you see it easily in column four and it takes a bit to actually be able to start identifying with the areas that it affects so it's like it's easily in the beginning that you see the column four stuff and that's the stuff that we, we ascertain in a rough way what, the, what our general troubles are and that's coming up in the four. And then after some time, it becomes easier and you kind of just go to the column three because you see, oh, that's fear. That's fear. Like last week, I was talking about my mom with the hair, hair shampoo. So in her column four would be, I didn't speak up when she was trying to sell me the bottle of shampoo. That's in the column four, right? So then I got rid, that's her part of it. But really her column three was the fear because she didn't want to look bad. She didn't, she wanted the reputation. She wanted the whatever it was, right? So people pleasing is in the fourth column, but then the fear of the emotional security or the reputation or whatever it is, is in the third. So after some time, you're able to identify and work with, work right out of column three. And, and that's like getting to the root of it. And then at the root, you'll get to typically is uh, it's your own self-worth. It's, it almost always boils down to your own self-worth, which takes time, right? It takes time to, to get there. And you'll get there if you follow the processes. Um, and a lot of people come in here and they do the first set of steps and they get a lot of that value out of the fourth column. And then they kind of don't really grow more, more than that. And then they kind of plateau and go, is that all recovery is about? And that's all they really know because now they're implementing, they're implementing the program and the principles just in their daily life as best they can. And they veered away from what the directions are. If you only live in the fourth column, you're only ever cutting off branches that sort of grow back. Mm -hmm. So you have to eventually move to that third column and get to the root of it. hundred percent. Okay. So then we get to being convinced the self manifests itself in various ways would have defeated us. We can consider it its common manifestations. That's really important. We're only considering, go ahead. 64. 
So we're only considering common manifestations of self. Common. What about the uncommon shit? The uncommon shit comes through working a program over time. Okay? The cunning and baffling part of alcoholism isn't the fucking drink. Isn't the drugs. It's your fucking mind. And it's self. That's the cunning part. Okay? And so when we're doing a first set of steps here, for anyone who's done one set of steps or maybe two, you're just fucking scratching the surface. It says right here, you're considering it's common manifestations. That's it. And that's talking about resentment, fear, and sex conduct. And you're only scratching the surface. So as you go through time and you keep doing these, these common things, you will get deeper in and you will see the cunning manifestations of self. And how that good intention now reveals itself as the motive. And you're like, holy fuck. I didn't really know I was doing that for the last 20 years. Even though you've worked your first set of steps and you got a lot of value, you'll get more value. Okay? And Janine talked about a line out of step five. It says, uh, ascertaining in a rough way. So we ascertained in a rough way what the basic trouble is. It says that at the beginning of step five. Saying, you know, you ascertained in a rough way what the basic trouble is in step four. What about the deeper than rough way? So if you're just doing something rough, think about anything you do roughly at home or at work or at school, a rough draft. It's a quick little scribble of a rough draft or whatever it is. You know, you do a rough outline of a fucking work area. But it, the details in that rough area are what really matter. So I can scope out a work area and kind of you know, kick my foot around in the dirt and go, this is my rough area. This is a rough way of where I'm going to work. But the real meat and potatoes comes when I actually take that rough area. And now I put the fucking tape measure down and I measure and I start getting my depths and my heights and my gravel bases and my sand and whatever I'm doing. And the foundation of what I'm doing there matters. The rough shit, yeah, it matters where I'm kind of working, but it's the details in the work area that really fucking matter question yeah what what would you say to somebody me who is asking when would you tell somebody to do a second round of steps if they've been doing really solid step tens Fuck, Third, are they fourth. first question is are you sponsoring if you're sponsoring you're fucking growing if you ain't sponsoring you're gonna fucking do inventory selfishly till the cows come home because you just want to fucking feel better and when the inventory becomes selfish you won't fucking feel good anymore. And so, you'll be like, what's the matter with me? And so then you're then you're going to go outside of the program and start looking for other shit to fucking ease you. Okay, so when you did a set of steps around or a specific thing that you did, say around year five, was that just because you were in like emotional pain? Was that the indication? No, I did the first set of steps when I was new. And then I did my next set almost two years later because I sponsored. And then I did another set like two or three years later. And then I just did a set like last year. So I've done four sets of steps in eight years. Okay. And the year five. Yeah. What was the, the thing? Like what was, what made you do another round of steps? It's just house cleaning, inventory, just your regular maintenance. It's just a good idea to do it every at least couple of years, I think. So okay. I've been just doing it every couple of years. Okay. But my sponsor has got me to do a four before, just a four. He's got me to do a hate list. Like, what do you hate? Which is resentments. Mm -hmm. So he'll identify certain things in my life and go, I need you to do this. And would you follow it up with a five? Oh, yeah, always. Okay, always. that's what I'm thinking of. And sponsorship is everything, but it's it's also not enough. So you have to have the tens and the elevens running just as much, putting the gas in the tank and mm -hmm. giving you the direction. Yeah, awesome. Okay, you'll know if you're lying to yourself. You'll know if you didn't tell everything. So the question was, how do I know that I've done a thorough set of steps so that I'm doing this properly and I'm not going to drink? Well, there's no like guarantee of that, I don't think, but I would say there almost is a guarantee, but you'll know inside. I knew when I did my first set of steps, I did it the best I fucking could. 
And then I went on with the business of doing the rest of what my sponsor told me to, to the best that I could, sponsoring, service positions, going to meetings, all those things. But then there, in the chapter working with others, it says nothing will ensure immunity so much as working with another alcohol. That's what ensures immunity. It works when all other activities fail. What are the other activities? Fucking everything except sponsorship, prayer, meditation, inventories. So that aspect works when everything else fails. So that's like really important. You want immunity? That's what it says in the book. Work with other alcoholics. It'll always save the day. It'll fucking bring you out of waves of resentment and self-pity. It'll do amazing things, man. Sponsorship has carried me through this whole program. Almost all of the women that I've worked with since I've been in Calgary have been people who have been in AA, relapsed, and then are trying to figure it out. And so from that, I've learned that people think it's a step. People think it was a failure here or a failure over here. But once we get going again, they find that it was it was more like they were driven by these unconscious things that weren't identified and they were running their will and thinking it was God. They were, you know, like there was some other things that didn't actually have to do with the four or the five. So it's like, if you hear people saying that, it's not maybe the full story. So I think Phil's right where, you know, you'll know if there's something that you're not saying. And then it's like, you, you just go up the steps as best you can. Like I said, with I was just talking to somebody at break and I was saying like the treatment center steps, like if I didn't have a willingness to stay sober and if I wasn't like actively really just getting out there trying to figure it out, I could have blamed my four because they were worksheets. I could have blamed my five. I could have, I could, there was lots of blame points. I could have, and I might've believed that. I might've actually thought that, but if you have a willingness and, and God doesn't make it to terms that you're seeking them, you know, it'll sort itself out. You just gotta just don't lie to yourself. Well, just like alcohol being the great persuader, right? Like it, it persuades us because we keep trying and we keep and we end up defeated. I think that for me anyways, my defects have been like that too, where it's like I keep mucking around and then it causes pain. And then I'm like, okay, okay. And then eventually I'm just like, okay, hey, there's a better way. This causes me pain. So I'm going to let that go. And then I'm in like the step six pain. And then I see that it's like a better way all along, but it takes, it's a process of that, you know, getting from I'm in pain, so I'm not going to do it anymore. Then I mess up and I do it and and then you know like the relapsing process then I figure out it's painful I don't want it so now I'm like trying to do something else and then eventually you get to a place where it's like that's God's will for me I can see that that and this is easier all along and then I just genuinely want to seek and do God's will when you asked how to bring that into your everyday stuff like that's exactly what what happened for me with the relationship and through my sex ideals I had the what would I not do and it was that not text men when I'm bored or lonely. So every time I felt that bored or lonely and I went to reach out in self, right? And, and do that behavior, I did, did the other thing instead with God. Like, God, I see that I'm about to act in this, direct me where I can be helpful, remove this from me, and then do the other thing, which was like, call my sponsor, call a sponsee, call it, right? And then you bring it in in those small moments and eventually you heal in that area and you're restored to sanity. Perfect. Okay, resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From its stem, all forms of spiritual disease. Re listen to that. From resentment stems all forms of spiritual disease. Think about that. Look at every person you know or look at your own life. Look at how fucking infectious that is and how toxic resentments are, right? The only one that carries that is us, right? And, and we can't do that anymore. For alcoholics, like it says here, it's fucking death. Um, we have not only been mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. One of the most important lines in the book, when a spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. In our society, what do they focus on first? Mental. mental. When the mental health is figured out, our society thinks you're going to be fucking fine. Well, look at the results of that. It's not fucking fine out there. The spiritual health of us is most important. Through the spiritual health, which includes mental health, we straighten out mentally and physically. And when you look at all the physical illnesses in our society today, 
a lot of them, most of them have a cause unknown because they don't know really where a lot of these things come from. Well, we do. They come from bad mental health. They come from bad spiritual health. It comes from living in fear. Your body's not designed to walk out the door and be fearful of everything, right? And fucking every moment of your life, you're making a decision based on, oh, I'm afraid that I'm not going to get this. Oh, I'm not going to get that. I need to act like this so I can get this. Like everything's fear-based. Your body's creating all these chemicals and whatever, and you're creating physical illnesses because your fucking mind is going so nuts over fear. But do you notice that? No, why? Because that's what you fucking learned in your fucking life. And you think that it's normal, which is why we implore you to look at the belief systems you live with. And are they actually fucking yours or were you indoctrinated with someone else's? And of course, we got to fucking fit into the society and, you know, have a roof over our head and shit. But there's a way to do that working with our God, the power that can fucking help us, right? So the resentments are fucking serious business. We got to get rid of that shit. So I'm going to go through a little process here and I'm going to get you if you're online or in person and you want to write like little numbers beside these so that you can match it to the columns in the columns when you get to a step four for yourself or when you're sponsored. So in dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. Right before, right after paper before we, you can put a little baby number one and that it represents your first column. We listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. After angry, you put a baby number two. Right before we, we asked ourselves why we were angry. In most cases, it was found it was our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, ambitions, or personal relations, including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore and we were burned up. Right after burned up, you get to the next sentence. It says on, right before on, a number three, baby three. On our grudge list, we set opposite each name our injuries. Was it our self-esteem, security, ambitions, our personal or sex relations, which had been interfered with? And I would also get you to underline, was it our just self-esteem, our security, our ambitions, our personal, or sex relations, which had been interfered with. So then when you go down to the page here, you see the example that they have. The number one is the baby number one that you wrote on the left-hand page. So it was in dealing with, uh, we listed people, institutions, or principles with whom you're angry. That's that first column. And in the example, it's Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, my employer, and my wife. And the baby number two, we asked ourselves why we were angry. That's the cause, second column. And you can put those numbers on the columns too. One, two, and three across the top. Go ahead. Sure. So the question was, what are the principles with whom we might be angry? Okay, so principles are like, these are the ones that I use for examples. Um, some people don't really like to be honest. Honesty fucking causes them a lot of grief. So honesty is a principle that they might be resentful at. And they might not even know they're resentful at honesty. But as you talk to them as your sponsor, you're like, you don't really like to be honest, eh? Maybe you have a resentment against honesty. Um, or maybe it's uh, responsibility. There's a lot of like street level alcoholics and addicts that are on the street on purpose because they don't like the responsibility of having to pay your bills, being responsible, productive people of our society. And they would put in their call on their one of their listed items, responsibility. Some people really don't like being a parent. Parenting is a principle. You know, and they may not admit that, but that's part of the goal. Who wants to admit that you're fucking resentful at being a parent? Nobody. But there's people that you got to look at the facts. You got to fucking write this shit down and go, I'm actually really resentful at being honest. There's fucking humiliation in admitting that. Why? Because fucking everyone else is going to look at you and go, fuck, you resent being a parent? You're a fucking mother, man. 
Mothers are supposed to love their kids and fucking take care of them. Well, I don't really fucking want to. So the person has so much guilt and shame built up on that principle, but they got to get honest with it and they got to put it down, right? So that's one idea. Or marriage. Marriage is another principle. Some people get married and then they regret fucking being married. Or monogamy, right? So there's many different principles. And I would advise, you know, you guys to like make a list of principles that you think might come up. And then just kind of go over them with your people that you're sponsoring. Or if you're writing a step four and just kind of, you know, ask people what principles they might resent. Just going to double back on this one. When women are resentful at parenting and you go deeper than that, it is actually the societal constructs that make them have to parent and work and, 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 and then there's the, the double standard and they're actually just usually overwhelmed. And that's usually what it boils down to is that it's like, it's not the parenting, but there's an overwhelm that it comes put on the parenting because the kids are obviously there and obviously annoying because it's putting everything in overdrive because that's where it crumbles, right? And that's the obvious thing is the annoying kids because they're right in their face. But when I talk to people, it's not parenting. It is like all of it. So I just yeah, want to defend people who do. It's, who cares? Well, that, that all comes, that all yeah, comes the through the talk and the step five. The, the, the goal of the step five is to take what she's trying to tell you now and fucking spin it around and show you something different anyway. So the resentment stays the same. And through the five, the sponsor's job is to spin that all around and show you something different that it's maybe not that, right? So. It comes up a lot. I just wanted to make sure you're not offending any women who are resentful about parenting. Oh my it's fucking a big God. Thing. So if I, I was worried about offending people. For the women who might be overwhelmed tonight. Oh my God. First column is those things in your baby number one. Second column is the cause. What are the reasons why you're resentful? And if you're writing it, you keep it short and sweet, just like it says on this list. His attention to my wife, told my wife about the mistress. The worst thing you can fucking do as a sponsor is let the person just have at that second column and write whatever they want. I have a, a boundary in this. You can have five maximum bullet points. Any more than that, you're not writing them down. Because what happens if the alcoholic and addict is selfish and self-centered to the core, and you give them a reason to write out all their fucking shit, they're writing it all in the second column. They're going to tell you everything that everyone's done to them in their life and why they're so fucking resentful. That's not helpful. That's not helpful. You give me the five biggest resentments that you have to the person, the place, the principal, the institution. And then we'll talk about the rest of them anyway. It doesn't matter. We're going to talk about everything else anyway. So we need this to be done in like a timely fashion too, right? Because once you get into the step four, now you're stirring up all these deep seated emotions and you need to get through that. The worst thing you can do is fuck around on a step four. There's two relapse steps in the program for anyone who's new. You'll relapse on step four, and then you'll relapse at step eight. And it's not my belief that you're actually relapsing at step eight, but that's what it looks like. But step four is the number one relapse step because people fuck around and take so long. And or the sponsors, when they do the fives, they fucking break up the fives over too many fucking sessions of a five. The five should be done fucking so tight and fucking done and moved on to the six. If you if you take too much time in the fucking five, you end up fucking up the momentum of the five and the subconscious uh, benefits that come out of it. Dave? Um, when you're going through the step four, or I mean the step five, uh, with your sponsors, say they have 81 questions. So the question is, if they have like 80 people on the resentment list and they have like times that by five 
bullet points in the harms, you're looking at like pages and pages and pages of material. And he's asking, do you go through every single one? Uh, yeah. So you go through every single one, especially when you're brand new to sponsoring. Because the, the worst thing you can do new to sponsoring is fucking start cutting corners on sponsoring. Okay. So you go through every one, bro. You set aside a whole day to do that step five. You fucking meet at eight in the morning and you don't plan anything. Don't make any plans for step five. Don't let your sponsee make any plans either. This is an all day affair. And if it takes five hours, it takes five. And it takes 15, it takes 15. And then you go through them. And then over the experience of being a sponsor, you will learn how to do certain things a little differently. And I won't really get into that right now. Maybe we will at the step five, but right now I don't think so. Were you going to say that people relapse at eight because of nine coming up? No, I was going to say people relapse at eight because it's not actually eight. They get a spiritual experience after five. And then they ride out that spiritual experience after the five. They do their six and their seven, and they seem like they're on their eight, but they're actually back at yes, five. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, anyway. So, yeah, Chris, it's the alcoholics that delusional. All right. <laughs> and then, so in the third column, affects mine. The reason why I got you guys to underline those specific words ab above, self-esteem, security, ambitions, blah, 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 is because you don't fucking make up your own. The sponsee doesn't make up their own. And another thing I'd like to emphasize, and she may disagree. I've had people disagree with me on this, but I don't care. Um, you don't fucking use worksheets. You don't do it your own way. You do it exactly how the fucking book lays it out. Exactly. You don't change shit up. That's fucking important. Because I don't know how many people, right, Alicia, we've met that have sponsored their own fucking way. And then they sponsored a whole bunch of people and they're sponsoring a whole bunch of people and all these people are fucked up and don't know what the fuck's going on because one person did it fucked up way. And then all the other people don't know what's going on. And then it actually affects people's lives. So if we can keep it to what works, which is this, we don't cut the corners and we stick to the fucking program, which is right here in the book. We don't use worksheets and I'll tell you why. Hang on, Thomas. I got you, bro. Why do I disagree with that? Well, I don't know if you do. I don't use worksheets. Yes, you do know. You don't listen then. Okay. <laughs> okay, she agrees with me. But like a lot of the treatment centers have the third column and they have check boxes. Okay. Did you not hear me? Like 10 minutes ago, I was like, the check boxes, they derail you because you're not actually thinking, you're just checking and you're not reflecting. Okay, we'll edit that out. No, I want everybody to hear you admitting don't listen. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Holy. Okay, but mo a lot of people will disagree with me. And it's nine times out of ten, it is a woman that disagrees no, with me. Sure. No, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm not saying that to hurt her feelings. I'm saying it to be fucking honest. <sighs> I better double back. Kidding, finish. Okay, so in the third column, it affects mine. Treatment centers use worksheets, and it's like check, 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 check. And remember when you were in grade three and you had to do the multiple choice, and it was ACDC, ACDC. And then at first, it was like, okay, you're reading the questions and you're trying to find the right answer. And then by question like 24, it's just like ACDC, ACDC. You don't even fucking care. Mm hmm. So that's kind of what happens when you have 80 resentments and you're trying to fucking decipher what it affects. You just start going, check, 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 check. The benefit of like writing every single one out and then you write it out on every fucking resentment. You write out what it heart, what it's affecting. You write out self-esteem, self-esteem, self-esteem. You write out self-esteem 500 times. There's something that happens in your subconscious that goes, I have fucking issues with my self-esteem or whatever it might be. And it changes you on the inside and it brings your defect to the surface. So it's really important to get your people to write it out and not do the shortcuts in this third column because there's lots of people that don't do shortcuts. 
The other thing people will do is they'll try to do this on a spreadsheet on their computer. No. Women don't do that. <laughs> Fucking pen. You put pen to paper and there's something about a pen to paper that also has something in your the subconscious. So we do it exactly how the book says. Don't change it up. Okay. I find it helpful to actually have a conversation about these, like what is self-esteem and what it, and define them before they go at this because then they know what they're actually writing down because even for me I was like I don't know what this means like how does it and so I found it helpful to have them defined as I went through um so that's just something I started doing and I agree with that especially with security because there's many types of security right emotional security financial security physical security security is a big one to really define mm -hmm. as long as as well as the rest of them also well, there's financial, emotional. financial, emotional, physical. Okay. The question was, if you switch sponsors and you've already done a set of steps and then you maybe three years later, go and do a new sponsor, a new set of steps. Do you go back to the beginning of like your first set and bring all that through with you? That's a discussion you and your sponsor have to have. That's a discussion you have to have with yourself. Because if I have somebody that's pretty well balanced and I won't go way back, there's no point. But if I'm working with somebody who's really struggling in the program and they can't find that emotional stability, I probably in their sex conduct, I want them to go right to the back, right to the beginning. And I'll walk through them. But it depends on person to person and where they're at spiritually and emotionally. When we talk about sobriety, the biggest thing I look for is... Uh, emotional sobriety where are they emotionally so mm -hmm. sober and if they're not too bad then we can pretty much start you know where their last step five ended off and like the time that it's been in between the steps so someone who just came out of a someone who just came out of a treatment center just did steps if i start working with them and they still have their set of steps their worksheets i would get them to bring the worksheets because they probably in the time they've you know, if it's been a week or a month or whatever, hopefully they haven't developed a whole bunch of new resentments, then I'll get them to actually, I'll show them how to put the worksheets actually pen to paper if there's anything else they need to add or whatever. But I'll, I'll go through the steps as they are out of the book. And then they have that and they can see the difference. And, and another thing is like, I'll always ask, how long was your last step five? How many hours? Yeah. Right. Maybe you've, maybe you've done three step fives and they were all an hour and a half each. And you're fucking 10 years sober, ready to blow your brains out. Well, I'm going to be like, okay, you've done three step fives and they were all an hour and a half. So you did them at the pastors. Oh yeah, yeah, I did it at the pastors. I'd be like, yeah, bro, you're going to write it all out. We're going to start from scratch, which I hate doing, but it's, it's worth it. And when you understand, like there's a part in the step four in the 12 and 12, where it talks about step four is a vigorous and painstaking effort to discover what our emotional deformities in each of us have been and are. We want to find out exactly how, when, and where these emotional deformities warped us. We wish to look squarely at the happiness, unhappiness has caused others and ourselves. Without a willing and persistent effort to do this, there will be little sobriety or contentment for us. So it's telling me I need to go back and find out how, when, and where. Sometimes I need to go way back to the beginning of my life. Like I've found guys with like sex conduct issues. I got to find out where it started sometimes. And where it started, well, it was their uncle's fucking porno magazine when they were six years old that they found under the bed. And their cousin Johnny and him fucking started looking at that shit. Oh, look at those titties. Oh, look at that. Look at this, right? And then so now they're developing a warped sense of what a woman is. And then it's possession. And then their next experience was porn, watching, you know, something their dad left on that totally fucked them up on the next bit of their journey of sex conduct. Watching their dad treat their mom a certain way or their uncles or a group of guys treating women a certain way. And then they're 40 fucking years old, single, fucking treating women like shit. And so I go way back and find out, okay, it was like you and your cousin Johnny finding your uncle's magazine. Then it was the fucking porn. And you really think that women are here for you, bro. 
You think that these women are fucking here for you and your pleasure. And then humble them, right? And show them the fucking truth. And then, okay, you don't treat women like women anymore. You know, you always hear, you know, you treat women like a woman. Treat women like women. With some guys, I'm like, you fucking do not treat a woman like a woman because you treat women like fucking shit. You now treat that woman with fucking kindness. You treat her like a human being. And when you treat somebody like a human being, it changes from treating them like a woman because that subconscious way of treating her like a woman is not a good way. So once you know how to treat them like a human being, and that doesn't come just on their own, it comes through lots of counsel with the sponsor and interaction, interacting and going through a process of learning how to fucking even do this. And it starts with a man-on-man relationship. I don't mean man-on-man, but a man-to-man relationship. That's the sponsor and sponsee. For most people, the sponsor-sponsee relationship is the most important relationship of their fucking life. Because it's the only relationship they ever fucking had that's real. And then from there, it goes, okay, now, buddy, now you go develop a relationship with a friend. Like a real relationship with another guy out there. And then it's find a friend who's a woman that you don't want to fuck. And then you develop that relationship. And then you develop. So it's a process of teaching some of these people how to even be in a relationship. Through those relationships, they find out the relationship with themselves. And all through this, God's all over this, right? And the sponsor's all over it. God-centered pillars are all over it. Step 10s are all over it. Like, there's lots of this shit, right? But it's really worth it. Okay, so that brings us to the end of tonight's book study.